I'm Lisa Stone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Parenting Aces. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we have another great show for you this week. We are talking college recruiting, and it's a topic that is, of course, near and dear to my heart with our whole hashtag Save College Tennis campaign and our Saul Schwartz tournaments. And this week, I have with us Tarek Merchant, and Tarek's been on the show before. He's written articles for ParentingAces.com. Tarek owns I'm Recruitable, which is a recruiting consulting company, and he played college tennis himself. Uh, he grew up in Canada playing tennis and went on to play college tennis in the U.S. He had a full ride, and that was pretty awesome. He has kind of done the gamut. He's played D2. He's played D1. He has graduated and gone on to graduate school where he decided not to play tennis while he was pursuing his studies. And now he's running I'm Recruitable to help other junior tennis players go through the recruiting process. Part of that involves running college recruiting camps, collegiate exposure camps. And we'll hear Tarek talk a little bit more about that once we get him on the line. But I am just so happy to have him with us again. It is the day we're recording is uh, signing day, spring signing day for college tennis. So there are a lot of announcements coming out online. Um, TennisRecruiting.net has been publicizing all the latest signings. So it's a pretty exciting time in college tennis. So without further ado, let's get Tarek on the, on the line and we'll jump right in. Tarek, thanks so much for joining us. Lisa, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be on your podcast. Well, you know, I consider you now one of my go-to recruiting people. You and I stay in touch even when you're not on the podcast or writing articles. We we email back and forth and try to help each other out a bit. And I have a lot of respect for what you do and how you work with junior athletes to help them through the recruiting process. So I'm thrilled to have you back on the podcast. Thank you. Much appreciate it. And likewise, appreciate what you're doing for the parents and for the junior players and your passion uh, is, is, you know, just amazing to see somebody taking their own time to really help people navigate the process through junior development into recruiting, college tennis. So thank you for all the work you've been doing. Absolutely. And I mean, you know better than anybody, this whole college recruiting process is absolutely brutal. There's so many misconceptions out there. There's so much misinformation out there. And so it's great to be able to chat with you and hopefully clear up some of this stuff that parents are dealing with. And, you know, hopefully some coaches are tuning in because the junior coaches need this information as much as we parents do, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, that's, that's what we're doing, right, Lisa, like between you and I and some people out there, we are, we're trying to help these players and and their families navigate the process. It's not easy. There's a lot of, you can call it like, you know, fake or, or misconceptions about the process. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, this whole fake news thing has been going around Facebook with the whole election and everything. And similar it's, it's, there's so much information now that's getting put out on social media and different content um, mediums that we're hearing so much more. And actually what's happening is more people are getting even more confused than they were uh, before. And so most of the calls I'm getting now from parents and, and athletes is like, oh, but I heard this, I heard right. that. And like, I'm more confused than I was a year ago, six months ago, two months ago. And what I've realized over the last few years I, and I've been in this business uh, a little over 10 years now, is that, yeah, it's just getting, it's almost getting worse. And we're supposed to simplify it. We're, we're supposed to be using these mediums to help people get the information they need. But instead, there's so much information. There's too many people trying to be recruiting experts. I don't even consider myself an expert. I think that's up to other people to determine what you do. But what I look at is people who are in, in the industry all the time. Like, for example, you're out all the time, you know, meeting parents, players, going to college events, going to junior events, uh, talking and interviewing, whether it's development coaches like, yeah, Todd Whittem and his um, player, Ronnie Holman, and his family recently. And you're learning and and 
listening to that. And so those are the types of people that people should be gravitating towards and understanding, you know, what they need to do versus everyone who just has an opinion. And I think that people are entitled to their opinion, but it's a very fine line between an opinion and actual facts and knowing how to navigate. Well, and to add to that, it's every single potential student athlete's journey is different, right? I mean, every kid's got different wants and needs. Every kid's got a different uh, balance between their academics and their athletics, what they're looking for in college, what their goals are in college, whether they're tennis related goals or academic goals. And so to kind of take one person's experience and extrapolate that across all junior tennis, all college recruiting would be ludicrous. I mean, you know, we know that we can't do that, yet we keep doing that. You know, we take one person's experience and and try to apply it to everybody. And interesting that you brought up the podcast with Todd and Ronnie and Ronnie's parents, because I, you know, I think it's really important for people to understand that that is one family's journey. It's a family that has means. And so they could take a different pathway than maybe somebody else who doesn't have the money to spend to send their child to live with a coach in another state, you know, and travel all over the country playing tournaments. So I, you know, I think it's really important that we continue to have these conversations, Tarek, and to to help the listeners understand that their family's journey may look very different from their next door neighbors or even their kids' doubles partner's journey. And everything needs to be individualized. We need to look at each player and each family individually and not try to lump them into a big group. Absolutely. 100% agree because it goes right from developing a player and, you know, the best coaches in the world will talk about a player's strengths, weaknesses, their talent level, their work ethic. We'll talk about the ways they can communicate with them. Even on the ATP level and WTA level, like you'll watch these announcers on when they're doing the Grand Slams and large tournaments, you know, they'll show inside ways of now how they're coaching them. And like, they will talk about how one player is completely different than another player and the way they coach them and the way that they help develop them was completely different, even though that coach has a specific you know, method of teaching. They're still doing it differently. And it's the same way when you go into college recruiting. Like when we're helping kids that I'm recruitable, it's so much more than just, hey, um, you know, I want to major in this specific school. I mean, sorry, this specific um, uh, area of study, or I want a full scholarship, or I want to go to school in the Northeast. Okay, but there's way more into it. And each particular athlete has their own needs and wants, like you said, but also things that are going to help them and some things that will be disadvantages. It's, it's not a decision just solely on tennis. It's a decision on your, on your education. It's a decision on the next sort of 40 plus years of your life. So it's not something that you just take by looking at one or two items or a, my coach knows five coaches. I'm going to reach out to those schools. That may not be your fit. It, it, you've got to spend time. And I think like to your point again is people – end up taking someone else's journey because they try it themselves and they don't first set up a game plan, but they think it's, oh, it's so complicated. And then they just revert back to what's easy. And, and that's where they get stuck because they're, they're, you know, they may have started too late and now they're panicking. They may not want to do all that work. They may not understand it and they don't know where to go. They may not have the resources. There's so many reasons for that to happen, but it absolutely happens. And, and, most of the time it results in a not so great of a decision. And they realize that throughout their years, some make the best of it because they have to, but a lot of them will have some regret. Well, and, you know, we can talk about this a little more as we delve into the conversation, but tennis has one of the highest transfer rates of any of the NCAA sports. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, You know, as an individual sport, there's a lot more, kind of ownership in your choice of school. And it's, you know, if things don't work out, it's not like you have 25 other people that are around you to help make the experience better. When we get down to the nuts and bolts of it, 
tennis, even at the collegiate level, is still an individual sport. And, you know, we put it into a team format for those four years of college, which is awesome. But if the player is unhappy, there aren't that many people around to really mitigate that and make it better. Uh, and so kids transfer and it happens and there's no shame in it. I mean, my kids transferred twice. So, um, and he's finally found his happy place. So sometimes it takes, you know, making a decision that maybe doesn't work out, um, and, and figuring things out before you finally make the right decision. Yeah, I transferred, you know, your kids yeah. transferred. We've talked about that um, off the record before. And, um, you know, sometimes that just happens. That's evolution. Like for me, there was a time when I fell, was in love with tennis, fell a little bit out of it, was doing other things with my life in, in my last two years of high school. And um, then I went to college and I re sort of kindled that, that, that passion. And I felt, I fell to a point that mm, probably 1% of kids would. Uh, and I started winning matches and I started enjoying it and I started putting in a lot more effort. And then I realized, okay, I felt sort of um, played myself at this sort of, I wouldn't say division, but, but area that I was in and the team that I was in and the way direction that they were going versus what I wanted to go. And I was also looking at my career after college. As good as I was doing in college my first couple of years, I was more concerned about the academics and the job opportunity afterwards. And I would say that's probably had a, a 60, 40, or even 70, 30 decision on transferring. Because, you know, I was in New Mexico, and the place where I was at was a very small town, and there was not, no real big companies and jobs that I wanted to do for what, for what I like. And so moving over to Florida, Jacksonville, a city with, that has a few million people, was a better opportunity for me. And so um, I think that, that that's normal. And, yes, you have less attachment being an individual kind of sport. Um, it's a little, it is still a little bit me, me, and I did love, and I do love the team aspect, and it was hard for me to leave the teammates that I had there, but at the same time, I, I had to look out for, for what was best for me, right? Sure, absolutely. So let's dive in here, and let's start with looking at how student athletes can increase their exposure to college coaches. I mean, if you're top, what? top 25 in the country in your recruiting class, you're probably being seen by everybody. But if you are below that, and I know that doesn't sound like a big number, but I, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tarek, but uh, if you're below the top 25 or so in your recruiting class, you have to go out and really make the effort to be seen. Yeah. So let's, okay. So let's break it down like this. Uh, kids who are playing, in America or internationally, okay, let's talk about the U.S. first. So in the U.S., uh, you have the national tournament. You have Kalamazoo. You have the clay courts, the hard courts for the girls. You have all those winter nats. You have all those events where college coaches are able to come, a large number of them, to view players. So you're getting exposure. And so, you know, the clay courts, for example, the boys' clay courts now in, in Boca here has a little bit more uh, reach of players, the number of the draw size that they have with the qualification and the main draw allows for more players to enter. But you, probably I'd say about the top 100 players, 150 players can get some exposure and visibility between uh, mm -hmm. in coaches in, in the men's and women's side. Mm -hmm. But um, and internationally, you know, ITFs will draw crowds, Orange Bowl tournament, Eddie Herr, those large events will draw coaches to come and you will get exposure. But you're right, outside of that, uh, you're looking at not getting a whole lot of exposure to these events. And what happens with the top 25 kids is that they're pretty much getting recruited regardless because they're just that, that good, you know? Right. And so everybody wants them. Everybody outside of that, you're right, they got to work a little bit more, which means going to the tournaments is one thing, but usually if you're outside the top 25, most of the time, you know, top 50 and even outside of that, you're not getting deep into the draw. So even if coaches are there, they may see you, they may not be able to see your first round or second round match, and you may be out of the tournament at that point. And so if that's the case, then you don't have the visibility, right? So it's just thinking about all those uh, scenarios that pop up. And so usually the kids in the top 25, yeah, they're going deep into a lot of draws. So coaches are seeing them, the visibility is there so often. 
outside of that, you got to find other ways to market yourself because tennis is a sport where the budget and the timing for the coaches and the amount of staff that they have doesn't allow them to scout the way programs like basketball and football and uh, baseball programs that have large staff where they have head scouts like on a tennis team, there's no such thing as a head scout, right? Right. So <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like it's the head coach, it's the assistant, and in many times the assistant is, you know, a full time, but in some way part time. I mean, a lot of assistants are just using it as a stepping stone to get the bigger job because they're having, you know, the pay isn't great. It just isn't. And so there are some programs that are, and that way you get two head coaches. And it's pretty awesome. But the ones that aren't, like, you know, with budgets and, and the amount of time that they can spend on the court, like, you're just not getting the amount of exposure that you want to get or should get, you can say. But that's just the reality of college tennis. Right. And, you know, one, one of the things I found interesting uh, when we were going through this as a family was the import that the head coaches put on their existing team members in terms of recruiting. So, for example, if your child has a friend that's playing for a certain school that you're interested in, you know, getting that player to talk to the coach on your behalf and put in a word is often a really good way to get noticed by a coach. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Like um, my, my buddies at Georgia state uh, coach Brett Ross, when he was over there uh, mm-hmm. who recently left uh, and now um, Johnny Wolf there, who's his assistant doing a great job. I mean, they got a top 30 ranking. I had a boy that I was helping out who ended up going there and um because of that, I, I stay very close with them. And uh, Brett would always tell me, like, how powerful for him and his school situation, because they're not, they don't have the big name school uh, right. that the Georgia uh, and the Georgia Tech, especially in that area, they're getting the kids that don't want it, can't go there. But I said, well, how'd you get so successful? How'd you get into that top 30? And he's like, one of the big things was the players on my team that bought into it. And I was able to recruit and sell the program well. And once we got that ranking and we were, we were doing well, they were telling their friends and then they were bringing them into me. Mm-hmm. And so that was a great avenue, especially since, like you said, NCAA rules and all that. Kids can talk to each other. They can kind of convey the message, uh, understand if the coach has some openings, maybe some spots, and right. start to get an idea of the landscape right through the voices of the coach going to the players and the players. Uh, telling their friends, uh, you know, the, the information that they'd want to hear. Plus, it's a uh, great way for a high school player to learn kind of the inside scoop about a school. You know, oftentimes if they have friends on a team, they're hearing very different stuff than when they go on an official visit and meet with a coach. Absolutely. I mean, I make sure every single kid that comes in my, you know, uh, sort of vicinity or that I have a chance to, to talk to, I encourage every single kid, and actually I demand it, that they must speak to more than one player on the team on a, not with the coach around, just on a personal sort of side mm-hmm. level, trying to get to know them first and then asking, so how is it really like? What do you think? And then listen to what they say and take everything with a grain of salt and realize some kids are going to have better experiences than others. Some kids are going to be pissed off at the coach because they don't play in the lineup or have their mandate. But just to get an idea, how is the overall feeling of the team? You get that when you go visit and you just watch and you observe how the team interacts with each other, how they interact with the coach during a practice, during a match. And then you ask them individually, so how do you feel? And um, I think that is probably the most important piece when you go to visit the school in terms of understanding because you can look at a school and there's a lot of beautiful looking schools. There's, you can, you can go to the admissions and you can hear a great raw, raw speech from the admissions. Why, you know, this is the greatest <laughs> school, why their alumni network's amazing. And you know what? Rightfully so. So a lot of colleges have unbelievable ecosystems, sure. right? Sure. So that's all great. You can go and check out the facilities. You can see for yourself. But what you don't know is that insider information. And I right. think that's the make or break for feeling like whether you're really going to enjoy it or not. And understanding that a conversation with the team captain may be very different from a conversation with the number eight guy on the team or eight girl on the team, right? Got to talk to more than one person. Got to talk to as many people as you can. 
get everyone's opinion. Why not? Right? Like you're there. Why not just talk to everybody and ask them all individually or a couple in a group, like how's it going? And you will get the answers that you want for sure. And circling sure. back to this whole issue of social media, this is where a potential student athlete can really use social media to their advantage because they can reach out to these team members on Twitter, on Snapchat, whatever they're using, you know, in the moment and get a feel. They can check out their Instagram, look at, you know, what kind of pictures are they posting? Are they posting pictures with their teammates or are they, you know, not so engaged with their teammates? And maybe everything on their Instagram is about friends outside of tennis. And is that what you want? Some kids want that. Some kids want the tennis team to be everything for them. And some want to be able to balance that with fraternity, sorority, other activities on campus, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. Like you said, everybody's different. That's what we said mm-hmm. in the beginning of this podcast. Yep. And that's what it comes down to, you know, that you do your research, you figure out if you jive with that team or not. And there may be players that you do and don't and you do your research. Yeah. Social media, like oh, in, in, in different divisions, they have different rules. Like, you know, uh, some coaches can't connect you to players. So like connect yourself. It's so easy. All you do is have right. to go on a, a line and you're probably going to make friends with them anyways at some point because you're going for a visit and it comes down to that point but like yeah just just add them talk to them dm them and you're going to get some answers right away and then like you said look at their their feed they're going to show you what they're doing on a regular basis yeah absolutely so okay so going more into this whole conversation sorry my thing just disappeared um about increasing exposure and visibility with college coaches so we've talked about the big tournaments you know being able to be visible and seen there we've talked about um connecting to the members of the team and having those existing team members talk to the coach on your behalf what else can these prospective student athletes do well, I think um, it, it's a tournament thing, but it's performing well at tournaments. So let's <laughs> I, that should be a no-brainer, it. right? Put <laughs> well, yeah, it this one: say you're interest, you're highly academic, you're a good player too, or you know you can be a two-star, three-star, four-star, doesn't matter. You are going to tournaments locally or regionally. You're not playing the big national tournaments, so you're not one of those top twenty-five, top fifty, top hundred, whatever players. And um, you're doing well in those tournaments. You're competing. You're doing well. Well, you know, if you're going to a smaller Division three school or D2 school or even D1 school and you live in that area or you're playing certain tournaments, I mean, you're, you're going to get on coaches' radars because that's the types of players that they're looking for, right? Not every, every coach wants a five-star blue chip player, but every coach realizes, you know, their team level and how they're going to progress. And so if you're full of one and two stars, you might want to try to grab a couple three stars for the following season or two, but you know that that's also your market, right? And those are, you need some players of that caliber there. So they're looking at those tournaments. So they're looking at them the way that the Georgias and the Floridas and the, you know, um, UCLA's are looking at those top national tournaments like Kalamazoo or the, you know, Sandy, the hard courts. So um, I think that doing well in those will get the visibility. You'll get the, the, the notice by college coaches. Another good way is, um, you know, just exposure events, right? Like, I mean, I think that's why, that is the reason why I started the exposure events because I, I was helping a lot of players that needed help, which was majority of the players that need help on a larger recruiting standpoint, not that I don't help kids in the top 25 because they have things that they need help with, mentoring and, and consulting, but majority of the kids are, are the ones fighting for a spot. The ones that are the two, three star, four stars that are really trying to get one of those spots because not everybody can. And they're the ones that realize that they need more exposure. And so where can they get that? Then at the same time, the coaches that are recruiting those players, they don't have the budgets and time to go see all these players, but they want to see a lot of them. So where can they do that? Exposure events. Bring a lot of kids at one place, bring a lot of coaches at, at the same location, put them together, connect them. The difference that I started to do that's less sort of uh, traditional because we're used to combines and showcases where kids come, they perform, they play, coaches scout, they write some notes, they leak. Well, what I started to do um, several years ago was allowing kids and coaches to interact. 
allowing them to get a hands-on experience. Because some of the things we just discussed, like going on a visit and talking to players and doing the hands-on experience, it, it's enough, it, people are listening in right now and, <clears throat> and, they're, and they're saying, oh, you know, like I'm understanding what you're saying. It's theory, right? It's like going to economics class and you understand <laughs> supply and demand. And you say, okay, well, if there's, if there's demand, you know, and I put up enough supply, I can sell stuff. Well, when you get into the real business world, you know, that theory is still a theory, but it doesn't always translate exactly like that. You right. need to actually get dirty, right? Do it just like you do an internship and you try to experience a certain industry. So that's what we've created, the culture where you can come and you can train with college coaches who are training you like they train their teams. So you're coming there and let's say the pen coach is there, you're doing a pen practice. If Yale's there, you're doing a Yale practice. If, uh, you know, Williams is there, you're doing a Williams practice, Amherst practice, you know, uh, Brandeis practice, whatever the schools that we have that are there. And we're bringing schools from Division One, Two, II, and Three, and NAIA, and we're giving them, an, giving coaches and players an opportunity to experience all different levels and divisions of the game. So how do you're you, experiencing How do you do that with the NCAA rules? Well, you know, these are developmental camps, right? So they're, they're recruiting camps by default on a secondary sort of standpoint. So the idea is that you come in and you're training. You're preparing your game for college tennis. That's really what we're selling, right? We're trying to provide them the experience and the preparation and the exposure. And, um, you know, college coaches are able to come and do that. You know, they're getting paid mm-hmm. as, as they're co-staffing the camps. So they're the staff of the camps are getting paid and the players are getting an opportunity to prepare and learn strategy and sample various coaching styles and different programs. And so you're teaching the kids not only on court, but you're teaching them all the knowledge and experience and strategies that you have off the court. And you talk about your teams and they tell stories and we educate them on what to say and what not to say and what to do and how to do it. And so, you know, you're coming there and you are developing uh, skills on and off the court. And that's really, really important because of what tennis uh, has as a budget in terms of the exposure. So really, kids can get the ultimate exposure at these kinds of of camps. Mm -hmm. And um, they can be pricey and it's costly because, you know, it's costly to bring kids on and to put on a production. It's costly for the coaches to come and they need to get paid for their time. And, um, you know, but I think that if everybody can do that once, at least, in their, you know, uh, high school years, I think that they'll just understand it that much better because it's a hands-on experience. Consider it investing in, in like an internship. Sure. Sure. So earlier this week, I published an article about USTA's college combine. They're doing it for the second time this year and, you know, they're making a big push. Um, there'll be coaches there and, and they'll have all sorts of activities around recruiting. Can you talk a little bit about what the difference is between the USTA's combine and the I'm recruitable camps? Sure. Well, I think one unique thing that I have that I can, that I can say more than anybody else can say, I'm the only one in the world that's ever done in tennis exposure camps and showcase and been successful at both. So um, I see it from doing both and my experience. My experience is this. Both are important. Um, what, they do two different things. So when you're going to a combine or a showcase, you're, as I mentioned earlier, you are going to be playing matches in front of college coaches. Some decide to do a few seminars, Q&A sessions, but they're very generic. And mm-hmm. um, you're not getting an opportunity unless you're – within the recruiting rules, which would make you a senior, that you would be able to actually meet face-to-face and talk to these coaches. Otherwise, for juniors, you know, starting September 1 or, or, or earlier, depending on the division, you are um, having to do conversations over text and email and phone calls. You can't do face-to-face. So um, basically, you're playing in front of them. You're playing in front of them. They're scouting you, and they're, you're hoping that they contact you after or you contact them. And... Um, that, that can be good in itself because you're getting a lot of coaches out there and an opportunity mm-hmm. to showcase your talent. Um, the difference between that and the exposure camp is that coaches are working with you. They're staffing the camp. You're on the court with them. You're talking to them. Um, right now, the NCAA bylaws state that um, you can have discussions on, on their college team and, um, and how they run it in those types of camps, in those camps and clinics. 
which you cannot do in, in a show day. And um, some of the other differences is, is just the being on a college campus, staying at the campus overnight, um, meeting the players. You know, you're just, it's an overall different experience. So like I said, both are really invaluable. I think once you get to a junior and senior, you'll want to do a showcase, but you'll also want to do the camp. Um, for the younger kids, you definitely want to get a camp in there because that's going to help you understand where you're at today, what the coaches are looking for for you in the near future, in the long term, as you, and what you need to do to prep yourself for that. So, like, you know, if you're a ninth grader, a rising ninth grader, and you're coming to one of our camps this summer, what are you going to get out of it? Well, you know, aside from what I just talked about, you're also going to understand, look, you know, if I want to go to this type of school, like if I want to go to Penn, I need to have these grades and I need to do this, um, you know, on my tennis level and I need to uh, communicate this way and this is how the coaches act and this is what they're looking for. And so understanding that from a young age also helps to develop, right? And so there's very few coaches, as you and I know, similar to Todd, who, who understand that and know that, but the ones that that, uh, you know, need that help, that, that's what they're getting out of it. And even if, if it's somebody like Todd who understands it, for that kid to come to go to the camp, talk with the coaches, get the feedback, come back and report that to his coach, and then to work together to help him, him or her get to that level, it's huge, right? Like, yeah, they, without huge. a game plan, you're basically just, you're just hitting tennis balls right. without a purpose. Right. And so if you're not auditing yourself every, you know, couple months, every quarter, every year, and realizing where you're, where you're at and where you need to be and seeing what's realistic, then, you know, you really, and if, especially if you don't know where, where to even go, what the level is you need to reach, then, you know, you're really just shooting darts in the blind. Well, and UTR is helping a little bit with that, right? I mean, kids can go on the UTR website and look at the UTRs of the lineups of the various schools and see where they fit in, which is a great way to kind of start putting together your list. But coaches, college coaches don't form their lineups based on UTR. They form their lineups based on a lot of factors. And so just because your UTR fits within the top six of a particular school, that doesn't guarantee you a spot in the playing lineup, right? Exactly. And that's like kind of my ongoing battle with UTR. And um, so there's tools, right? And there's tools that we have on our platform too, that, you know, you can search colleges, you can get data, you can connect with them. So, and, and UTR is doing the, the data where they're showing you, yeah, the, the players and where they're ra- rated and how do you compare to them? But the problem that I have with that at times is, okay, so you can get an initial indication of the teams and their levels. But remember that every team is always trying to recruit up. Right. Nobody's right. trying to stay the same because for them, staying the same is going back. Right. So um, they're always looking to recruit higher. And then, you know, you're going into some, some details, right? So let's say what UTR could be really great for is, yes. So you might want to make a list and say, all right, you know, my, here's my UTR. I want to see if I fit in the top six or the top three. That's how I do it. So let me give you how I do it. If I'm first going on there and looking at a player, I'm going to look, I'm going to create and export a list of players in the top six, like um, that I fit in the lineup with, and I'm going to export top three. Okay. And so why I do that is because first want to see, you know, what schools I may have a chance at versus schools that I have a better chance at. And especially mm-hmm. if you're looking top three, you're now talking, I could probably earn a larger scholarship at this school. I could be an impact player possible. But that is simply just a guideline. And what happens from there is you can build a list and it may be 150 schools. But from that 150 schools, you should not think in your head, one, I can play a few schools. Because Mm -hmm. the other factors come in. Now you got to reach out to the coach and find out who they're recruiting, um, how many spots they have available, you know, what type of level of positions they're trying to to fit, um, you know, what type of yeah, sorry. Um, players that they're trying to to get, and um, then you can start to narrow your search down. But that's the only way you can do it. Okay. So you need to make sure that you are not only building a list, but as soon as you build that list, you got to make sure that you are contacting the coaches and then realizing that even if you fit in their top six, you may not have a spot. Right. Just, well, they, they just may not be recruiting someone like you. 
Yeah. And you, I mean, you mentioned this, that, that the coaches are constantly recruiting. What I've heard, and, and we've talked about this on, on the podcast many, many times is not only are they constantly recruiting, they're constantly trying to replace their number one, right? They're trying to find a better number one. So that means everybody pushes down. So if you barely fit you know, your UTR barely fits in their top six, the likelihood is you're, you're probably not going to make the line up there. So that needs to, I, I, I want to just say that again, and you, you said it too, but I want to make sure people hear that, that, you know, just because you fit within the number five or six slot, that number five and six player may not be in the lineup next year. If the coach is having success with recruiting. Absolutely. And that five or six player may not even be on scholarship and they may be walk on and they're yeah, they get so many reasons, but that's why I do the top three thing because mm-hmm. if you fit into the top six and you're fitting in as a number five or six, just like you said, like the likelihood of you getting something is, is, is less certainly mm-hmm. like um, they're recruiting up, they're trying to be better and um, you jumping in one of those spots, the only way that usually that happens is when they're losing three, four, five players. Right. And then they're looking to replace so many, and so they'll be willing to get a five or six the same caliber or as they had before just to maintain, but it's not their first choice. Right. It's not their and first if, choice. They if they're losing play. players, it's really important to understand why they're losing players, right? Is it because the players are graduating or are the players transferring? And if they're transferring, why? Right. You have to ask those questions. Yeah. Yeah. And you're probably not going to get always the, the, the truth from everybody, but you should ask those questions. You should get as much information as you can. And, um, you know, that's where that's where I'm huge on is like, you know, these tools. And, and that's that's sometimes where I feel like the marketing gets con- construed a lot with mm-hmm. a lot of companies. It's like, you know, we're trying to simplify recruiting, but we're not saying that you're doing less work. You're actually doing more work than ever before, because when I was going to college, it was easier in a lot of ways. Some things were harder, like I had to mail in a VHS tape to coaches, <laughs> funny as, as that is, right? And but but I was talking to a few coaches. They're talking to me, and the reach of players that they had was limited. So they're looking at they were looking at 10, 15 players, maybe five players. And, and now you're looking at, they're looking at 50, 100, because yeah. people are emailing them, sending them YouTube videos, they're going to these exposure events, they're going to the national events, they're going to ITS, and they're just building a massive list of potentially good players. We are now, it, it is now the landscape of the world. And people, you know, just making a side point here, is people write on social media a lot, like, hey, you know, what's the deal with, how can we, how can we get more American players into the system? Well, it's not that the coaches are recruiting internationals. It's that the internationals are good too. And so they're just looking for the best players. And so they now have access to those players, you know, and tennis is international sport. And so, you know, it's not going to be dominated by American players. It's going to be a large percentage. And I think it's the largest uh, sport percentage of international athletes in the world because pretty much is one of the most international sports. I mean, soccer is pretty international, but it hasn't gravitated yet um, on the college scene because there's so many leagues in Europe and around the world where kids go and train and get to the pros. But if that was to go away, I think soccer and tennis would be the two sports where you would just naturally see international, not because people don't want to recruit Americans. It's just because that's what it is. And so um, I think it's important to point out, and we can we can dive more into this, Tarek, is that the international players a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they come to a school in the States sight unseen. They've never made a visit. They've not talked to one other player on the team. They've only had interaction with the coach and they are looking for playing opportunities and scholarship money to fund their education. And so... What happens is with especially some of the smaller D1 schools and especially the D2 and D3, well, not as much D3, I think, but D2 and for sure NAIA schools is the American kids aren't interested in going to those universities or colleges. The international players don't know. 
So as long as there's a spot for them in a lineup and some money to help offset the cost of their education, they're thrilled to have the opportunity to come here to get an education and to continue their tennis development. Absolutely. I think it's just a cultural mentality, Mm -hmm. immigrants. I mean, we see that here too. Everybody who's been sort of born in the Western world, we we don't want to, you know, clean toilets, for example, or do some of the, what what you might call the dirty jobs for lack of political, you know, terminology. Menial, Uh, menial, let's call it that. All right, we'll call it that. But, you know, I'll be, (laughs) I'm just going to say it as I I see it. And it's kind of like, you know, people don't want to do those jobs. And so like, you know, I'm a son of an immigrant. My dad came and he had no problem doing whatever job it took to get the opportunity, right? And right. he was in a different position. So I don't want to, I'm not going to make any general comment uh, about anybody in particular. And I don't want to offend anybody because everyone's got different situations. But um, yeah, the international kids are, are looking for an opportunity to come to this great country, right? That, that we live in and take on this great opportunity of college tennis and, and realize, I think, how great it is just to be a college tennis player regardless of the division or the, the scholarship amount or who's the best player on the team or the fanciest school out there and the names you can brag to your friends. And I think that's one of the things that's getting lost in junior tennis in the United States. Yes. Is they're getting too fancy. We're getting too involved with, um, you know, I- I'm going to this school and I want to tell all my friends, like, how about we just put our, you know, get our hands dirty again and we go out there and we compete and we realize that, there's a level for everybody and that um, you, you want to play and you want to improve. And if that's your mandate, then it may not be going to Georgia or Florida or Texas or whatever school you consider to be sort of a high level school. And um, those opportunities are just taken up by international then. Right. And um, the, the American kids, and I, I see it in two ways. So a lot of American kids will feel content being the number eight player at Auburn or Wake Forest, or wherever it is, mm-hmm. and um, they'll never play because they just want to go to that school. Now, on one side, I see that certain people's points. They say, well, you know, I just want to go there. It's going to get me up into the school because the coach is still going to help get me in the school, and I normally, if I go through the regular admissions, I wouldn't get there, and I'm okay being number eight, and, you know, I'm going to try. I like tennis. I just want to be on the team, but if I don't play, the education is really my goal, and I'm using this as an avenue to get it. But the problem, the other side that really bothers me is the kids that go to the certain schools that they want to, to impress their friends and to feel good about themselves for the moment, be number eight, nine, 10 on the team, think they're going to play, think they're going to have the opportunity and they don't. And then it doesn't really help them at all. You know, like they get nowhere really with that. They end up dropping out. They end up getting discouraged. They lose interest. They lose confidence. And so what's the point of doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, if it's not about the school and, and you're, you're having the mandate of going for the education first and that's your way to get in. If it's all about, you know, hey, I, I, I could go to this school because education will still be great, but I can play and I could be a contributing member on the team and I have an opportunity. Yeah. Why wouldn't you take that? And so right. I think we're getting lost with that. Yeah, I think so too. And and that kind of is a great segue into talking about some of the myths around college tennis and recruiting. And the first one and the biggest one is that D1 is the best and everything else is inferior to D1, right? Right, right. And I think that's, that, you know, that it's, it's interesting because I understand when, when you come into um, understanding and, and getting interest in recruiting and college sports from a, from, yeah, the recruiting and business standpoint of it. Uh, you're used to seeing football and basketball on TV. You're watching March Madness. You're watching, you know, um, the, 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 um, you know, the college football playoffs and all that stuff. Um, and you're like in the bowl games and you're like, well, D1, you know, these are the schools. If I go to these other schools, like I'm not on TV and I'm not getting any good out of it and they're definitely the best and um with every sport it's a little bit different i mean um i did i did a little numbers for you as well that i wanted to share with everybody but okay. i think that we can't blame people entirely because it's the marketing and that goes back on to you know even my my back and forth with utr and other companies in tennis 
and even the USTA is like the way we market, we have to be very careful if we really want to help players. Because we can't say that, hey, there's a tool and it's going to, if you fit in the top six, you're going to get recruited. Or if you come to this combine, you're going to get recruited. Um, you know, I don't say that for my own business. I, I explain how much work is involved and I explain that these are tools to help you. So the same way with the conception of D1 and stuff is you got to utilize the tools and understand a couple things. So first, you got to understand in men's tennis, there's 261 Division One teams. There's 168. And these, by the way, these numbers that I have, I get from a data resource that is the largest data provider that works with all the schools and we license data. And we also work on it and talk to the coaches and figure out who's got opportunities and okay. uh, programs. So these numbers that I have are from our system, but give or take a handful, you're within the right numbers. So again, okay. 261 uh, we have for men's D1, 168 for D2, 333 D3 teams. Wow. Huge statistic that people don't understand. 332 on our system, and it could be a few less or a few more, Division three teams to the 260 plus to the 168 or so, Division one and two. Like, I mean, your, your reality is that you're more likely to play D3 than you are to play D1 and two. That's the first thing people have to wrap around their head. Um, on the women's side, numbers go D1, 332 programs. D2, 220 programs. D3, 374 programs. Wow. Again, again, there are more D1 teams. There are more D2 teams for women, but there's, you know, a lot of D3 teams too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, maybe the reality of playing D3 is a little less than men, but everyone's sort of listening and understanding where I'm getting at with this, right? And yeah. here's another great statistic. Um, so people think D1's always the best. Well, you know, for the most part, your top 50 to 75 teams, yeah, they are the best of the best. That's the reality pretty much in every sport. But once you go outside of those 75 and you look at the other, you know, 200 teams or so that are left, where do they stand against the D2 and D3 teams? Well, TCU on UTR, because that's a great gauge. No one's going to deny that, that uh, UTR gives you an idea and a gauge. Their power six rating for TCU is 85. That's the top uh, rating they have for D1. Um, in D2, it's 78, which is Barry University here in Miami. So if I compare Barry to the D1 teams, I'm going to find out that uh, Barry is uh, among the top 75 teams in the country wow. uh, if they competed in D1. So, so if you're saying to yourself, I can't go D1, I'll go D2. Well, there's teams like Barry and a, and a bunch more that you wouldn't be playing at either. Because, right. <laughs> you know, if, if you're looking at the top, you say, I'm not going to look at the top 100 D1 teams, I'll look at the D2 team. Well, no, they're in the top 100. Right. And then same thing for D3. 75 is the top on the Power 6 rating. If 75 is, is Middlebury. It's the top D, D3 team. I'm talking men's tennis, by the way, right here. Um, Middlebury, Amherst, and Williams all have these 75. So, again, 75 puts them in the top sort of 85, 90, 100, let's say. So again, if you're saying I'm going to go D3 because D3 is the weakest division, I mean, and I'm going to go look at Middlebury, Amherst, and the best ones there, well, they're top 100, D1. Right. So, um, you know, five stars and blue chips players, if we're talking tennis recruiting terms now, um, which is a good, easy gauge for everyone, is uh, those five stars and blue chips are going to not only TCU and, uh, you know, some of the big-time D1 schools, they're also going to Barry and the big-time D2 schools, and they're also going to Middlebury and Amherst and Williams and all the top D3 teams. Yeah. So um, you really – and the reason for that is simple. Um, it, it was what I talked about just a minute ago, which is the value on the education. And so there are – you know, tennis players are looking at education. Um, we know how difficult the sport is. Um, tennis, college tennis, it can be a breeding ground for the pros, but it's not a breeding ground the way the NCAA is for basketball and football. You know, the kids that are going there, you know, they have, there's a chance that it's literally the, the farm system breeding ground. It's not necessarily true in, in tennis. Uh, a lot of tennis families have uh, financially, are financially well off, and they're looking to say, I'm willing to pay the money. So it's the supply and demand again. Mm -hmm. the, the demand is on Middlebury, Amherst, Williams, and schools like that to say, you know, I could go to, I don't know, FSU or 
uh, USF or I don't know any school, but I think that the education is better at this place. And I'm actually, even though my kid is a five star blue chip and getting you know a 50% scholarship at, at that one of those schools, I'd rather send him to Middlebury. I'd rather send him to Williams. I'd rather send him to Amherst. And and if they are academically strong, they're gonna get academic scholarship money at that D three school that may even exceed the tennis scholarship they would have gotten at the D one school. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I mean, and and this is the story, and I agree with you about the marketing, and, and I, I've had these conversations with the various organizations as well, even going so far as to suggest to USTA, who now does the top 25 college tennis rankings every week during the season, and I'm on that ranking yeah. committee, why not do the top 10 in D1, D2, D3, NAIA? Let's publish a ranking for all the divisions instead of just looking at D1 because all that does is perpetuate the myth that D1's the best and everything else is inferior. Absolutely. No, Lisa, you're 110% right. We need to do that for the sport. Like my personal mandate, why I got into this business is, is to educate people properly not to do what everyone else has been doing <laughs> and trying to take, because it's easy to do that, right, Lisa? It's yeah, easy to put on what people yeah. want to see and what people want to hear because you can make an easy sale. You can get away with it. It's what people want to see. But you know what? People need the truth now. And um, the more work you have to put in, um, it, it's just going to, in the long term, it's going to be great for people like you and I because um, eventually when people realize as they do when they go through the process, um, what we're saying is actually the reality yeah. and that what everyone else is sort of trying to give you on a, on a, you know, uh, just, just give you, make you feel good and make you make it like seem like, Oh, it's so great. Well, it's not always, you know, picture perfect. It's not always great. And so once they figure that out, they, they appreciate what we do. And um, I think the biggest problem that I have in the industry is like, it takes a lot a lot of hard work and effort. I work twice as hard than others do. I really do to give that information and to explain it and to, to take something that's not easily marketable or easily explained and to show people the right way. And that's the problem. People don't want to do that. And, and that can be, you know, and that can be my problem sometimes with USDA, uh, for example. Like, you know, um, be good at what you do and, um, and put in the effort. Because if you half ass it, it's just not going to work. Well, and, you know, we're not doing tennis any favors by continuing to tout D1 as the end all be all of college tennis. We are, I think, discouraging people when they find out that either A, they can't get recruited by a D1 school, or B, maybe they can get recruited, but there's no scholarship money available to them. And so to understand what's available at D2 and D3, and again, and also NAIA, which, I mean, we've got Georgia Gwinnett College right here in the Atlanta area, and they can compete with any top program of any division in the country. They've got an unbelievable team. So making sure that families understand these various options and to get away from this whole idea of if you're not playing D1, you're less than, you know, we've got to keep pushing that message, I think. And I, you know, that's one of my missions. I, I'm a big convert to D2 and D3. And I, uh, you know, I think for my own family, you know, my, my son might still be playing college tennis if he had gone that route instead of going D1. Yeah. I mean, it's just a reality. You've got to understand that the majority of the players are playing D3. Yep. And D2 and D3 combined over D1, right? And so if that's the case, then we got to make sure that that information is out there. And so I spend a lot of my time with players who have, you know, sort of gone with what they hear and see and thinking D1, yeah, and then they don't get those. I spend so much time trying to pump them up about D2 and D3 and educating them when they've been deflated because they think they've lost and really they haven't lost at all. And so you're right. The, the message has to be from the start, you know, like, hey, D1, D2, D3, no matter what division you're playing, you're getting the college tennis experience. And as I just stated in my facts, you could be at Middlebury, Amherst, Williams, and you could be playing at a top 100 D1 team if you wanted to. 
right? And so that doesn't mean that the caliber is any less. It doesn't mean that the training is any worse. There's, you know, Eric Buderak, everyone talks about right. his story, but there's, yeah. should, there are way more guys than just Eric, right, that are out there. There are a lot of guys out there and, and girls out there that have had success at the D2 and D3 level and have gone on to do great things. When a lot of them, because of the landscape of D3, especially being highly academic, a lot of them could, but just don't. They choose not to, you know, right. but they could. And people don't know that because they didn't do it. Right. Because they decided not to go cho- join the pro tour and play the challengers and all that stuff. But I guarantee, I would, you know, every year you could get a group of D3 players that could do really great on the tour, um, but just choose not to. Right. Right. Well, we're down to our last few minutes. So I wanted to just give you an opportunity to tell the listeners how to get in touch with you, how to sign up for the camps. And I want to just put out there that you have generously offered a hundred dollar discount to any of the parenting aces community that wants to attend one of your camps and they just need to use coupon code P A for Parenting Aces, and that is valid through May 15th of this year. So thank you for that. That's a really generous offer, Tarek. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Look, our our mission, my mission especially, and my company is to educate and give the player the opportunity to get to college. And however we do that through our products and services, that's what we want to do. So um, with families, you know, and that, that – can use a little bit of a discount. We want to offer that back to you guys. And I think like for the listeners out there, you got to subscribe, you know, if, if you haven't subscribed properly to Parenting Aces, you got to, because Lisa's, you know, on a mission to, to really educate you guys and help the parents, especially get this done. So um, I, I want to direct your attention to both of us um, to get in touch with, with me um, and in our camps, you can go to collegiateexposurecamps.com. And you can find all our summer camps that are happening this summer at the University of Pennsylvania and Yale University. Um, you can go right down to the contact us form if you have questions. If you want to reach uh, me personally, you can access me right there. Um, the message will get to me. Uh, you can go on imrecruitable.com and you can access our online recruiting network where you can access the information, some of the stats that I was giving you today about finding colleges, roster openings, building your own player profile, communicating with coaches. That's a really cool tool that we've recently developed that um, will have a real big um, impact over the summer and into uh, next year for players to really manage and navigate the recruiting process. And, um, you know, I just want to thank you, Lisa, for having me again on the show. We just want to keep educating parents and players and letting them know how they can best navigate this, what can be, you know, a difficult process. I think the one piece of advice I'd love to give to your um, to your listeners out there today is, is put in the work. Put in the work and start early. Start the process. You know, we let um, rising eighth graders come to our camps. And a lot of people will write me and say, oh, you know, isn't it too early? It's not because you're getting preparation and education, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast. It is all about understanding the landscape, getting the experiences, you know, in, in action, and then doing your research, using the tools, the more you know about it, the better you're prepared, the more opportunities you're going to have. And so um, parents, get out there, help your players, help your students and your, um, your children get educated, educate yourselves, and um, make sure that you put in the effort, the work, the work that needs to be done. It's harder now than it was yesterday So um, I, because of the amount of uh, competition you have. But I think that if you put in the effort and you do the research and you, you know, um, uh, utilize the services tools and uh, listen to people like myself and you, Lisa, um, they'll be way ahead of the game and they'll get those opportunities and they'll have a great successful college career. Absolutely agree. A hundred percent. Couldn't have said it better myself, Tarek. Thank you for that. To my listeners, we will have links to Tarek's websites. Uh, we'll have his contact info there and also the information on the camp discount. So be sure to check the show notes for all of that information. Tarek, thank you so much for doing the podcast again. And um, we'll have, you know, an ongoing conversation with you. I suspect you'll be back in, in a few months and we'll do this again and talk about how the summer went and what's on tap for next year. And to my listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. And we will catch you next time on Parenting Aces. 
I'm Lisa Stone, and you've been listening to the Parenting Aces podcast. For tennis parents, by a tennis parent. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to us and write a review on iTunes. For more information on navigating the junior and college tennis journey, please visit us online at ParentingAces.com. Thanks for tuning in and sharing us with your tennis community.